let me just welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you today. Today is a special session of the forum, and I'll explain why and how important this is in just a minute. Now let me explain a couple of things. First, this is a special session, um, and that is we are creating this session because something very dramatic, very significant um, has just happened, two major Supreme Court decisions. So I think of this session, which doesn't take place in our normal slot, as a kind of emergency meeting. Uh, this is where we can quickly explore, try to understand, and start thinking about one of the most salient events to happen in higher education in the past few years. We haven't really done this before very much, and I'd be curious at a meta level what you think about it. Um, now, the subject that we're looking at is, of course, two very recent Supreme Court decisions, one of which shut down affirmative action as an admissions criterion in elite higher education, and the second one which uh, shut down the Biden administration's effort to try to forgive some student debt. Now, what do these mean for higher education? What do they mean for individual academics? What do they mean for academic programs, for questions, um, and for um, uh, all kinds of choices heading forward? That's what we're gonna be exploring today. And we're in the hands of two excellent, excellent people, two great professors at two great universities, both of whom specialize in, among other things, law and what it means for higher education, um, both of which might be familiar to you before. Uh, Zach has been a guest on the program and Mark has been a redoubtable participant. So without further ado, let me just bring up the first of these, uh, Zach Blamer, and uh, I'll bring you, just mention as I'm bringing him up, um, as I was trying to build out the website for this program, Zach's entire life changed. Um, he was at a small college in New England called Yale, and just this past month shifted to another small joint in the East Coast called Princeton University. Uh, Zach, welcome aboard. Great to see you again. Hey, thanks very much, Brian. Good to see you all. Oh, I'm, I'm really glad you could make it. I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, what you can add. I'm, I'm curious. I, I've asked you this before, but your life has changed a bit. So I guess the question, your answer might change too. Um, what are you looking forward to for the next year of your work? Uh, what are the big ideas and what are the big projects you're going to be focusing on? Yeah, so uh, you know, I think I should probably set people's expectations for the next hour beforehand, which is that I've spent the last couple of years thinking about race-based affirmative action and other race-neutral alternative admissions policies. I'm not sure, I mean, I have so much to say sort of outside of that scope. I think there, there are a lot of possible things that have uh, pretty dramatically changed higher education the last week that we ought to talk about, but uh, that's sort of uh, that's what I've thought about and I think we'll be able to best contribute with regard to. Uh, for the next year, I'll be thinking a lot, uh, well, I'll be moving to a new institution, but also thinking a lot about the, the, uh, the sort of integration ramifications of ending race-based affirmative act as well as uh, thinking about what happens inside of universities, especially around college major choice, when oh. kids from different backgrounds come in and are either choosing what to major in or, as is the case at many public universities, uh, these choices are being made for them using you know, GPA restrictions and other policies that limit kids' access to certain college majors, which interact in, in, in interesting ways with admissions policies. Oh, fascinating, fascinating, especially majors. I haven't heard anyone talk about we're going to have to ask you about that in in, in, in just a minute or so. Um, let me uh, um, right now put on stage uh, your fellow panelist and our great friend um, Mark Rush, and let me bring him up on the on the stage as well. Hello, sir. Uh, I can see you, um, but cannot hear you. Your microphone seems to be turned off. Yeah. Um, Wesson, I think you get to swing into action here. And uh, Mark, while you're working on that, uh, just make a noise when it's back live, um, and we'll and we'll rope you into the conversation. Um, uh, Mark is, among other things, um, a wonderful advocate for liberal arts, uh, liberal education, um, and he is also um, a major advocate for international education. Um, and he is also someone who has done a great deal of work uh, on the law and so I always turn to for legal and policy questions. Um, while he's working on that, Zach, let me, in fact, let me just get him off the stage so he doesn't have to keep you know, ogling at us. Um, Zach, just to begin with, uh, thinking about this huge decision, how do we, what's the shorthand for referring to it? Are we going to call it the Harvard decision or the student's decision? 
Yeah, exactly. It's either the SFFA decision or you know, the decision against Harvard and UNC. Okay, okay. Uh, and friends, before I dive in, let me just say this is a... Um, I'm going to ask our excellent experts a couple of questions, but then I want to get out of the way so that you can perform your questions and your queries. Um, so please don't at all be shy. Um, this is a place for you to explore. And again, this is a very, very fast moving topic. This has just appeared in the world. So if you have questions and you're nervous about them, don't be nervous. There's a lot to talk about here. Um, so I'll call it for sake of argument right now, I'll call it the um, S what, SFFA? SFFA, Students for Fair Admissions. Fair admissions. Okay, so the SFFA case, um, the, Supreme, the majority of the court, six to three, ruled uh, that Harvard and, and uh, uh, North Carolina can no longer consider admissions um, as an open, explicit category for shaping their admissions process. How am I doing so far? Is, is that right? Please. Yeah, totally. Well, what, what does this mean? for higher education going forward. How do we get to respond? Are admissions offices across the country throwing out their playbook? What's the next step here? Yeah, it's very interesting. You know, 10 states had previously faced affirmative action bans at public universities, though one in the case of Texas, uh, it was, was invalidated years later. And so we have a sense of, you know, sort of from a bird's eye view, what happens when universities year over year suddenly are unable to use race as one criterion for admitting undergraduate and graduate students. But in each of the cases, there are differences, both in the kinds of institutions that, uh, and the policies they were already implementing to provide right. race-based preferences, and differences in the specific wording of the, uh, the, the policies that were implemented. So you know, we have this new wording, you know, it's something like 45 pages of uh, uh, summary and decision that was provided by John Roberts last Thursday that gives a substantial amount of guidance to universities about uh, the reasons for which they are not allowed to use race in admissions, but also some guidance on how race or race-related criteria are still permitted for use in undergraduate admission. The clearest question is there's sort of like a wait and see period as there's now an active negotiation at each of the public and private universities where these uh, policies were implemented between admissions offices, administration, and legal offices mm. trying to decide exactly what is permissible and what the admissions policy will look like this coming fall. Oh, that's interesting. So this, this really becomes even hairier and more complicated as we try and set this up. Um, yeah, it, it's, it, I suspect we're going to see a lot of different kinds of changes happen at a lot of different institutions. So one primary difference is going to be between the super selective private universities that uh -huh. received a lot of public attention, but which enroll a very small number of students. Uh -huh. We've never banned uh, certain admissions practices at those institutions. And so I think it's sort of unknown the degree to which they'll be able to continue basically you know, resulting in the same admissions class that they have in past years just you know, making pretty minor changes in either admissions decisions or in admissions justifications to end up with the same uh, resulting class. That's unknown. What we have a better sense of is what happens at selective public institutions, flagship schools uh, in states that have uh, highly selective institutions. We, we, what we've seen in states like California, Texas, and Michigan, the, the states yeah. with the most selective flagship publics, that have previously implemented affirmative action bans, as we've seen pretty substantial declines in Black, Hispanic, and Native American enrollment on the order of 30 to 50 percent. Wow! Uh, at those flagship schools, year over year, immediately after these uh, policies are implemented, and then sort of you know, very different stories at other institutions. So you get this cascade effect where there's no net enrollment change at mid-tier and less selective public universities because those schools are both losing students to the end of their affirmative action policies and gaining students from more selective schools who are no longer able to get into those more selective institutions. So mm, I think mm. in expectation, we would see that kind of cascade pattern in many of the public university systems that were, were still using race-based affirmative action. These are schools like UVA and UNC, the University of Wisconsin, Penn State, Georgia Tech, et cetera. But, but exactly you know, what will happen in private schools, I think, is somewhat less known. That's interesting. 
And this gets even more complicated because so a private school, well, like like your two schools, you know, Yale or Princeton, um, but versus the the leading publics, you know, the Michigans and and uh, and the UT Austin. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, well, what? Yeah, there's also you know, there's other interesting things that could happen. So you know, I think one thing that uh, is possible is that the states that have already seen affirmative action and implemented could get net in Hispanic students. Because those schools were already not doing affirmative action. Now there's a bunch of other schools that have stopped doing affirmative action. Hmm. Black and Hispanic students who had previously gone to those other institutions are still in large part going to enroll somewhere. And many of them could flow back to schools that had, you know, had implemented affirmative action bans years earlier. So you know, to give one example, Berkeley and UCLA saw a, a, a relatively small but meaningful net outflow of Black and Hispanic students to the Ivy League after Prop 209 ended affirmative action in 1998. And it's possible that some of those students will now return to selective flagship public institutions uh, uh, that have become no more admissively welcoming to them, but whose counterfactual options uh, uh, may no longer be available. Oh, that's interesting. So this, so we won't just have the, the and I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but the simple story of ending from direction missions and then black and Hispanic uh, enrollment drops, but this may actually Play out differently across the nation. Let, hang on one second. I'm going to I'm going to bring Mark uh, Rush back up. Uh, let me see if his audio is live. And Mark, are you there? Uh, is it working? It is. And I, oh, I, it, it's it as everyone says. It is so good to hear your voice. Um, Mark, wh where are you coming to us from today? I'm coming to you from Lexington, Virginia, in my office. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. And you can tell by some of the Red Sox paraphernalia in the background. Oh, I'm I'm not going to go down, down yeah. this road. But but are are we likely to be ambushed by your uh, puppy today? No, no, no. He's at home, hanging out. Okay, okay, okay. Well, that's that's too bad. But I understand. I understand. That's that's very good. Listen, Mark. What's just to carry our tradition of introducing people? What what are you working on for the next year? What are the big topics and what are the big projects? Um, really, what I'm working on uh, right now, it spins out of some of the uh, discussion we'll touch upon today, but just the um, working on a couple of essays talking about, um, you know, the court's reliance on notions of tradition and how that really compares to uh, Thomas Kuhn's notions of scientific revolutions. And I'm arguing that basically the court has to uh, consider how it relies on tradition. Because on the one hand, you certainly appreciate that. On the other hand, the legislature needs to break from it. Otherwise, you're stuck in antiquated paradigms. So we don't want to navigate by flat earth technology, nor should we continue to administer and interpret the law based on 19th century visions of liberal constitutionalism. So that's what I'm working on. Wow. Wow. Um, that sounds very exciting. And then, are you, and, and then uh, you're teaching this fall or the spring? Well, I'll be teaching... Um, uh, of course, uh, our introductory global politics course, a uh, colleague and I are trying to rework that really again to make it look more as a <clears throat> forward looking global politics course, breaking away from old notions of conflict and whatnot. Um, and then I'll be teaching a course just on the intersection of law, science and technology. And that'll oh, be a excellent. first year seminar, which is always great. You know, if you do it with the first year students, they're wonderful. <clears throat> excellent. Excellent. Well, welcome. I'm so glad that you can that you can join us and bring this expertise to bear. Um, I'm I'm curious. Uh, have you have you heard our conversation so far? Uh, on and off. I had to go okay. back out and come back in to get the mic working. Uh, I, well, I, I guess I I can build on this a, a, a bit. Uh, Zach has been great about explaining um, the ways this starts to impact uh, different institutions and in different ways. Uh, I'm curious what what could uh, an institution that wants to um, really support Black and Hispanic students or increase the number of Black and Hispanic students, what can they do now uh, following the Harvard case? Um, to tell you the truth, I'll, be, I, um, I'll bring a skeptical um, response and, uh, and uh, approach to this. Um, I, I pretty much disagree with most of what I've been reading in terms of commentary. I think this is going to have very little impact. Uh, at the very end of the opinion, Justice Roberts left open a couple of loopholes that were very vague. I think essentially admissions offices will have to do a little more homework to demonstrate that they're relying on something other than race specifically. <clears throat> so class or whatnot, SES status uh, will become more of a proxy for it. But I don't think it's gonna make a whole lot of difference uh, to tell you the truth um, in the sense that 
you know, when you think about it, you, you read the decision, how are we going to police this? Um, how will the federal government police it? How much, uh, you know, mm. manpower is the government really going to dedicate to making sure that we now, what, admit 10 more students of one background and 10 fewer of another, metaphorically speaking, in a class of 1600 at Harvard, and then you multiply that by all the universities across the country. I think this is really going to be a tempest in the teapot. Uh, I think the more important aspect of the decision, honestly, is what it and and the decision about the student loans um, really exposes or, or highlights about the current state of American politics and really the history of race relations. Um, you know, there was there have been there's been some great writing recently in the Times and whatnot saying, yeah, let's blow up the admissions process and really work on not just higher education at the upper micro sliver of the higher ed mm -hmm. structure, and let's mm -hmm. focus on what's not happening K through 12. Let's uh, focus on you know resources that that should be directed perhaps to non elite schools, so that fighting to get into Harvard and Yale becomes less of an issue as there are more quality options out there at least. As, uh, as are perceived by you know students and their parents when they're applying to schools. There are a lot of great schools, but we only hear these conversations sure. with a handful, and that's really a problem, I think. So that's my quick response. Well, that's a that's a great response, Mark. Thank you. Um, I mean, it, it seems like this this problem just really uh, becomes even more complex. Um, and now, I mean, it stretches from the tactical deployment of a given admissions office all the way through to how we rethink all of the education system in the United States, not just uh, graduate schools and universities, but also K through 12. Um, in, in the chat, uh, people have thrown in a couple of really, really good points. Uh, our good friend, uh, George Station, uh, responding to uh, Zach's point about different states, uh, shared a story from um, uh, Inside Higher Ed about how one American state, Missouri, uh, just uh, their attorney general just sent a letter to colleges, both private and public, uh, and told them to uh, start changing up uh, their uh, uh, affirmative action policies and admissions as well as scholarship, I believe, George. Um, thank you for catching that. Um, and that that does sound, Mark, like one answer to uh, the policing question mm -hmm. uh, as for an attorney general to do it. Um, again, that's just one state um, to question if that's going to be uh, echoed elsewhere. We also had um, Patricia Suarez. Patricia, I hope I got that last name right. I, I'm always dreading mispronouncing that. Um, points out that uh, time is ticking quickly along as the common application opens August 1. Uh, so the timing here is, is, is very, very interesting. Um, let, me, let me stop throwing questions at you two for now. And I, I'd love to hear questions from everyone um, in the group. And again, friends, if you're new to the forum, the very bottom of the screen, that white band, the uh, press the raise hand if you'll join us on stage. Uh, and of course, press the question mark if you'd like to type in a question. And as an example of the letter, uh, let me bring up a, a question from uh, our good friend and polished, polished questioner, uh, Tom Hames, uh, who asks, why has higher ed resisted income-based affirmative action for so long? It's legally simple and would do a better job at diversity than race-based admissions. I'd love to hear from both of you on this. So I can speak to the story in California. That's, I think, what I know best. So when California you know, passed a ballot proposition in 1996, ending the use of race-based preferences, its public universities had to put a lot of thought into how to reform their admissions policies to reduce the preference uh, explicitly on race, but otherwise maintain diverse campuses across the University of California system. And uh, some of those uh, policies were made, uh, policy changes were made very publicly. So in 2001, three years after the, the ban was implemented in 98, the state implemented this top percent policy guaranteeing admission to most UC campuses for the top 4% of students from every high school. That mm. functions effectively as a class-based affirmative action policy and uh, as a policy that tends to increase Black and Hispanic enrollment not by changing admissions in any way at the most uh, uh, privileged high schools in the state. All of those top 4% kids could already get into selective universities. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, for kids coming from the least privileged high schools in the state, even whose top students would have otherwise not enrolled at most UC campuses, it pulled those students in. Those students tended to be lower income and from uh, minority backgrounds. And, and so this had a diversifying effect, though, uh, not to the same degree as affirmative action, either either in terms of race or class. 
But the University of California also implemented a number of policies that were not as publicly known. So there was a substantially increased preference for students coming from uh, low income neighborhoods, for students who came from high schools with larger minority populations, as well as high schools with lower income backgrounds, and explicitly uh, an admissions preference for students from lower income backgrounds. And so what you see, if you just look at like the average income composition of students at say UC Berkeley or UCLA, after Prop 209, the average proportion of students coming from lower income backgrounds fell because race-based affirmative action had been in tendency pulling in lower income students. But uh, it quickly rebounds and you end up with roughly the same number of, or same share of low income students at Berkeley and UCLA huh. starting in about 2002, about five years after race-based preferences ended. Uh, that has now persisted through the present. Now, that being said, while the, the number of low income students uh, is roughly at those universities long run equilibrium, you nevertheless have much smaller black and Hispanic shares on the order of 30 or 40 percent lower relative to the state population or the, the high school graduating shares of black and Hispanic students at those schools as you did before uh, race based preferences ended. So in tendency, class based and race based preferences pull in very different groups of students, race based preferences only slightly increase lower income enrollment, class based preferences only slightly increase net black and Hispanic enrollment. But we do see universities very explicitly going out of their way to target those students. Um, and, and I think it's very likely that we would see such policies implemented around the country in the next couple of years. There's nothing in the uh, in the in the Harvard decision which would make um, uh, class based economic class based uh, affirmative action. No, uh, indeed, I think go. John Roberts explicitly calls out that uh, class based preferences would be permissible. Uh, it's only race that's protected category. Yeah, of course, that said the same thing and called out. That's something I think the that was what uh, excuse me <clears throat> really uh, informed some of the protests about legacy admissions too. Gorsuch came out and said, hey, just reallocate your funding and your admissions preferences away from legacies and athletes to lower income kids and you can take care of this problem, um, which I find intriguing uh, really is essentially what Clarence Thomas said back in 2003 in his opinion in the Grutter and Gratz decision. He said, look, you want to solve your problem <clears throat> and achieve diversity. Um, he told Michigan, you don't have to be so elite. You can be less selective. And again, this gets us then into the question of the mission of a university should be. Mm. Um, is it to be selective or is it to educate? I think, you know, when you think about it, if you drew a radius around every university in the country, metaphorically, mm -hmm. of say 100 miles, every university, in the, many universities could diversify quite easily. Um, so if you change some of the criteria and you decrease the competition for selectivity, you can achieve these outcomes as well. Um, again, is that something the universities want to do? I, obviously not so far. But uh, again, getting back to what Zach said, yeah, Ro Roberts, but especially I thought Gorsuch very uh, quickly stated this, that hey, you, can solve, you can solve this problem very easily if you want to. But it sounds like, uh, at least in the case of California, and um, that the economic class-based solution did not work. Um, if we accept that, uh, 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 if we use the high school, uh, top 4% of the high school as a proxy for economic class, um, it, it seems like there's something, while a lot of Black and Latino families are disproportionately located in the lower classes economically, it seems like something is being left out. So it sort of depends what you mean by didn't work. It's true that these policies did not increase black and Hispanic enrollment as much as race permanent action, though they did indeed bring in a, a large number of low income students. It, it, I think it surprises a lot of people for exactly the reason you just mentioned that providing explicit income based preferences doesn't increase black and Hispanic enrollment more mm -hmm. than it does. The reason for this is that even within income group, the test score gaps between races are very large. So even if you just you compare kids with the same parental income backgrounds, black students have substantially lower test scores than white students who themselves have substantially lower test scores than Asian, Asian students. And so what this means is you can sort of think of a test score as being maybe a measure of academic preparation, but also as being strongly influenced independently by both income and race. So being a lower income student means you tend to have lower test scores. Being a black or Hispanic or Native American student tends to, uh, to mean that you have lower test scores. And these things are sort of additive, mm -hmm. such that if you just target on the basis of race, 
you tend to get middle income or even in some cases upper income black and Hispanic students on the margin of admission. Whereas if you target on the base of income, you tend to get lower income white and Asian students who are primarily on the right. test score margin for admission to universities. And so getting back to what the, you know, the under, excuse me, <coughs> the allergies in Virginia are having their way with me. Um, the, uh, you know, the very end of Roberts's opinion leaves then, you know, leaves it open, you know, I think pretty big loopholes uh, essentially to achieve, you know, the diversification of universities across the various lines that we're talking about, income, SES, race, whatever, the, they'll just have to be a little more creative in how they explain what they're doing. So again, and again, you, I think it's important to keep in mind what, what are we arguing about here or discussing. We're talking, you know, these cases with dealing with pretty elite universities. Right. Um, I think there was a great piece, what, in the Times a couple of weeks ago? Uh, no, just a few days ago by uh, Aram and Stevens, you know, talking about how for the most part, this hasn't made too much of a difference because if you get away from elite, the elite schools, the impact of our discussion yeah. today has been a different sort of um, phenomenon. So I think, again, uh, in the long run, this will be Tempest in a teapot. I think what's more important is the debate it set off already, though. Students protesting outside of Harvard about legacy admissions and so forth and asking, really, what is the mission of the university? Uh, so this this lets, uh, this lets is drawing attention to admissions as a whole and other admissions mm -hmm. issues. Sure. Uh, I, I have more thoughts on that, but I'd love to instead to hear from uh, uh, our, our, our community. And um, uh, dear Roxanne Riskin, um, has a, a comment. She says, ChatGPT mentions uh, SCOTUS decisions uh, on uh, Fisher versus the University of Texas of Austin 2016 using holistic, sorry, using holistic admissions policies. I have no idea if this is accurate. Can you discuss more about holistic admissions? So I can talk about how holistic admissions works in, again, I, you know, sorry to be a sort of broken record here, but I may be talking about California today. So okay. let me tell you about it. It's <laughs> okay. It's lots of, lots of evidence there. Like, yeah, yeah, a school like UC Davis or UC Irvine, um, you know, highly selective uh, uh, University of California campuses. So, uh, so, so the University of California through the 1990s uh, uh, admitted students using point-based admission systems. So uh, students, uh, those applications got points for, say, GPA times 1,000 plus SAT score plus your scores out of 800 on three SAT uh, subject exams. Oh. And then they would have application readers go through and say, give you uh, out of 500 points on extracurricular activities. Or you got, at the time, explicit bonus points for coming from a black or uh, for being black, Hispanic, or Native American, for being lower income, for being disabled, et cetera. You add all the points up. You order all of your applicants. You have cutoffs, first, uh, just an academic cutoff, and second, a cutoff based on all of these different points altogether, and you've, comp you've composed your class just on the basis of these point schemes. Uh, universities, since the Grants and Gruner decisions, even in public universities, have largely moved away from these point-based systems because uh, uh, race became unavailable as a, a, a target for these points. And so UC Davis switched to holistic review in 2011. What this would have meant at UC Davis is rather than having this elaborate point scheme, instead applicants send in applications and uh, application readers, uh, two for each application, will go through the full application, throw out lots of applications that uh, are seen as really having no chance of admission to the university, and then have like overall point systems uh, uh, or points associated with each application. So you might have a score out of seven of how competitive the application is at the university. And then after all of these uh, applications are scored on this relatively coarse scale, uh, high scores are admitted. Now, what this allows readers to do is to say, oh, you know, this kid has a relatively low SAT score, but there are compensating differentials. They came from a one parent household or they went to a high school that was relatively low preparation on average. And so we're gonna give this student a high score despite the fact um, that in traditional measures of academic preparation, they're relatively low performing. Uh, the case, uh, yeah, as, as Mark has said, uh, the case rules out using race explicitly in, uh, in sort of evaluating these compensating differentials, but leaves some room for universities to, for example, uh, say that while this student got relatively low test scores, uh, they faced discrimination earlier in life on the basis of race, and that discrimination itself uh, provides this compensating differential allowing universities to target and admit some of those students. 
and, and so I, I suspect we'll see more of that happening. Now, it, it, I think it's sort of unclear in the 10 states that had previously banned affirmative action whether these kinds of sort of second order uses explicitly, but using ramifications of people's race in their application. Sort of unclear whether prior to have prohibited those uses in the states with affirmative action bans, to the degree that that was sort of, you know, that the national ban now looks sort of like these uh, state bans, that I think we would still expect to see large Black and Hispanic enrollment declines at schools, even those already implementing holistic review, because this explicit race uh, uh, information is no longer available. And again, the only evidence I think that we have to suggest that that's what would happen is looking at what happened at, at highly selective schools in California, Texas, and Michigan. But, uh, but uh, there, there's a lot of the sort of criteria that universities can point to in holistic review that in many places, in, in many cases, replace the informational content that race provides. And, and so it, especially at super selective uh, private schools, it could just be that the, these things sort of cancel each other out. If, if you will, that, that's, that's on, the, uh, on the demand side, where the, the university admissions office and, and, and their associates. But also, I mean, I think on the supply side, is, is it not just kind of an, an open secret now or best practice for the, any student who uh, is a, a Black or Hispanic by identity, that then they should emphasize that in their personal statement uh, or in other ways? That's where some of the criticism is said, you know, in the various and sundry postmortems of the decisions is that this will simply gamify the application process even further where everybody will be looking for, you know, looking for a hook in that respect. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, too, speaking of the supply and demand side, Brian, um, you know, again, for whom is this a problem? And again, I refer to Aaron, Aaron and Stevens again on the 4th of July. Um, for schools that, again, you, I, I hate the terminology, but for schools who are less selective, who take more of their applicants. Sure. It's going to be much less of a problem. It's the ones like a Harvard, despite their resources, where you have 60,000 applications for 1,600 slots or what, 600, you know, 600 to 1.5, you know, applicant to seat ratio. Um, this more holistic or this will be holistic cubed, you know, application reading process is going, it's, it's going to make a, an already expensive process extraordinarily expensive. Uh, again, tell the faculty who are always complaining about the hiring of too many staff, that we're now going to quintuple our admission staff so we can give every application an appropriate read. We'll go bananas. Um, so, so you know, call it what you will, this again is really going to make a real difference at that micro sliver of elite schools where they have to deal with extraordinary number of applications. If you're less selective, you have more seats, this will, it'll be much less of a problem to diversify your student body. So if you're at a, if you're at a middle tier state university or a lower tier private college, uh, you're not going to be able to quintuple your admission staff in order to do a serious holistic reading. But on the other hand, you aren't necessarily having to do that holistic reading because you aren't as selective by yeah. definition. And again, that's not a judgment. It's just simply looking at the numbers and whatnot. Of course, of sixty thousand applications for sixteen hundred seats, or you know, shrink the fraction. You've got a much easier process ahead of you. Well, first of all, Roxanne, thank you for the great question. Uh, and I'm delighted to see you using ChatGPT in that way. And gentlemen, both of you, thank you for the, for the rich answer. I mean, this is, a, th this, this is a decision that seems to have just further and further ramifications the more we look into it. We have a, another question or a comment uh, by our friend uh, Kiel uh, Domsch, who asks or states this, uh, the problems with both emissions and debt are mostly caused by higher ed's control credentialing elite degrees given preference in hiring. Alternative credentials could help solve this. So what do you, what do you think? What if uh, if we turn more towards uh, production and use of uh, alternative credentials, how might that change things? Wow, yeah, I is, think it's cool. Uh, but who, who, which alternative credentialing outfit is going to compete? I, mean, I, I think it's great. I suppose go back to Lane and Garth in their garage and they probably had all sorts of funky credentials, but who is going to respect them except, you know, the guy hiring at the local record store? Um, and I'm not being snarky there. I think it's important and it, it's a great question it raised. I, you look at higher ed, people have called it a, a bundling cartel with regard to credentials and whatnot. Does it need to be rethought? Sure. Who's going to do it? Um, but it does raise the question about whether or not, especially in an age of social media and access to so much in the way of digital resources, um, 
will students or whatever young people decide there are alternative way pathways to education and employment but will employers accept that i don't know Hmm. Good point. So, you know, there's a long uh, economics literature trying to distinguish between the degree to which uh, education provides labor market benefits because it credentials people and right. the degree to which it provides labor market benefits because they learn something uh, right. while they were in school. Right. And at least my read of that literature is I think we have growing evidence that actually a lot of what's happening uh, it does really seem to be learning, though it doesn't seem to be very well captured by things like the exams that we use to measure that learning, which is to say the, the labor market return to alternative credentials uh, has not yet been shown to be substantial. That may be because employers don't understand them or may be, be because whatever the valuable thing is that happens inside of universities that transforms 18 year olds into adults isn't happening in these alternative credential programs. Ah. But, uh, but, but I think you know, the best that we can say right now is that the value of uh, um, uh, uh, a four-year degree and especially a four-year degree from a research university in the labor market appears really large. And so at least in partial equilibrium, you know, given you know, taking the labor market as it is, mm -hmm. yeah. there's a lot of value in sort of thinking about how to best allocate that, uh, that higher education system to students who can most benefit from it. So the sheepskin effect is still there and still present. It's uh, what at least the least we can say is that there are very large labor market returns to degrees, though I'm not sure how large mm -hmm. the sheepskin effect is per se. If I can just follow too, please. I'll beat in the horse, but it suggests as well again, well, what's the alternative credentialing? I mean, in some ways there's credentials and there's credentials. And right now, if you look at the applications processes and whatnot, you know, there's a cartel within the cartel because, you know, you read about the literature and the pressure. I mean, my kids went through this, um, you know, invited to apply, you know, and so forth. And then, you know, here again, what, um, you know, there are the elites who seem to be conveying one set of credentials. And then there are the non-elites who are conveying solid credentials, um, oh. but they don't happen to have the right name on the sheepskin. So the alternative credentialing actually fits into just trying to build and expand upon you know, whatever we want to call it, the elite base of higher ed in the States. And we have the resources for that, but it's just, you know, you're trying to sell a non-elite school to an applicant who honestly believes he or she needs to go to an elite school. How do you do that? And I'm not being sarcastic. I, you no. know, and I'm just simply saying that's the nature of this game. Uh, my kids went through it. Uh, we had just several kids from where we live were invited to apply to one school. Actually, there were two different ones. Uh, they never were heard from again. They got into actually better schools, but clearly all they were, you know, they were invited to apply to jack up the rejection rate. We, you know, we were joking, the parents of those schools. So the nature of the game, what is and is not an elite school plays into this as well. No, that's a, that's a very good point. Keel, your, your steady focus on credentials is, is terrific. And I'm really grateful for you to be doing that. And I think uh, Mark and Zach have given you some uh, really interesting ways of developing that further. Um, Thank you both. We have more questions that are still coming in. Uh, and uh, George Station had a really, really good point. Um, let me just bring this up on stage so you can see it. Um, public universities have HR affirmative action plans and policies if they take federal funding. So all of them. Do these plans disappear or do they stay pending a SCOTUS case about staff and faculty? Oh, I'll flash that on the screen again so you can see it. So. HR affirmative action for hiring rather than admissions. Mark, I think you know the answer to this question. Uh, uh, you know, um, we'll wait until see. We'll wait and see what happens when the case comes along. Um, mm. You know, again, you would, the, the logic of this would suggest that this is problematic uh, or will be problematic. It's um, you know, again, higher excuse me, higher ed, public schooling, and so forth have always been sort of one sphere of this as opposed to employment being another um so i don't know but you would, you're right i think the logic of the case would suggest then that affirmative action and hiring now could come under the microscope as well um, uh, so we might be back to uh to zach's earlier point about this appearing in all kinds of ways across the whole ecosystem of higher ed in sure. many, many states unless you can come up with a just an explanation you know so, I, I, one sure. good yeah, no, actually, I think I was about to say exactly what Mark is about to say. So I'll make one point here, which is that you know, the first set of piece of 
Brian, I lost Zach. Am I the only one? No, um, Zach, I think you froze up. Um, uh, can you refresh uh, your screen? Uh, just reload that. Um, in the chat, folks, uh, anybody else getting uh, seeing Zach freeze up? I want to make sure that that's, that that's happening at the system level. Uh, Wesson, can you um, can you ping? Yeah, it looks like a connection, uh, a serious connection issue. Yeah, um, um, Wesson's on it. Um, here, I'm going to bring I'm going to bring Zach down right now um, so that uh, um, uh, we can take care of that. Um, the uh, uh, we have more questions that have come in and I'd, I'd love to hear more of Zach's thought and we'll, we'll bring him back. But I want to make sure that we get a chance for uh, everybody to ask their questions. Um, and so, Mark, this one's up to you now. Uh, hope you're ready. Uh, and and this, this is uh, from Brooke Kyle who asked, this decision is focused on admissions. Any insight into if financial aid leveraging models may be impacted if points are assigned for diversity as well as test scores, GPA, et cetera? Great question, Brooke. I suppose so. This would be after the fact. Once we've gotten, once we have finished our process of admitting folks now, presumably in a holistic, virtually colorblind way, you know, is someone going to be snooping around to say, aha, but the money's being allocated differently? I don't mm -hmm. know where this will go because, I'm, frankly, if you look, uh, Gorsuch and Roberts both said, well, move money away from athletics and legacies towards, you know, lower income folks or whatever. Uh, again, maybe that is a proxy within this very vague loophole that Roberts left open. Uh, won't be a problem. Again, we'll have to see. And in order to do this, remember, it's going to take somebody with the resources to go and get the evidence to make a case and work their way up to the Supreme Court. So mm -hmm. this, e even so, this that question is probably several years away from us at least because that's a lot of resources and a lot of proof you've got to get through the court system. And quite a process to uh, to win through. Oh, that's... Waiting, can we touch upon just, uh, I want to, I don't know if anybody wants to talk about it, but the student loan decision too. Yes, just just, just one second. Um, Brooke, I, I wanted to thank you for that uh, excellent question. And just note for everybody before we transition to the second decision that we're talking about, again, a very complex uh, series of, F, of effects as a result of this decision uh, that will play out in many ways. And Mark's point about researching this as well as enforcing it, um, I think are especially important. Yes, uh, so the other decision, uh, Mark, what's the name of the decision about financial aid? This is uh, Biden in Nebraska. Okay, so the Biden decision, man, uh, that sounds weird to say. Um, the uh, So the Biden decision basically clobbered the Biden administration's plan to forgive student loans at scale using the HEROES Act. Mm -hmm. And now the Biden administration is on uh, to what they call Plan B. Um, so what do, what is this, what is the Biden decision going to do to my gosh, just to higher education and to all the people who have loans, including a great number of people who are on this call. Well, I think, you know, it's, this is critical. And in, in, in teaching con law, I always urge everybody, do not read the news. Do not read the pundits. Go read the case. And what this case is about is actually has nothing to do with loans, financial aid, higher education, or anything else. It has everything to do with separation of powers and how much money, excuse me, how money, how much power and discretion do you want to give the executive branch, the president and all his staffers, the bureaucracy? Um, and how, you know, despite what may or may not appear to have been Congress's intent in, mm -hmm. in allocating power to them. And mm -hmm. the court has read this as saying, well, no, what the HEROES Act said was okay, was making modifications and whatnot to loans and whatnot, but it did not give the Secretary of Education the authority to cancel loans. That's a big jump. And the court is saying, this has got to be clear. Congress gave you power A, it did not give you power B, and so you can't claim power B. Okay. Uh, one way to look at this is simply to say, okay, fair enough. Um, two responses. If Congress wanted to give the president power B, it could get up and rewrite a law tomorrow. It has that power. Uh, this Congress isn't likely to do it. It's so polarized, that's another matter. The other question that comes into play, honestly, is, well, if the president goes and does this under the auspices of the HEROES Act and Congress doesn't do anything or complain, can we not infer that Congress is saying this is okay? Uh, that's a question that does pop up in criticisms of the court when it renders such decisions. But back to this 
closing quickly, I see on the time, Congress can do this tomorrow. They can give the Secretary of Education the power to suspend or cancel loan payments. They just have to say it clearly. That's all this decision said. If Congress says that, the Secretary of Education can do it. So this doesn't say outlaw the idea of student loan forgiveness. No, it's just says that not. Pre President Biden, as the chief executive, didn't have the power to do it this way, and that Congress should really be the one to do it as they have the power of the purse. Right. And to put it in partisan terms, if you don't want President Trump to have had this power, you can't give it to President Biden. That's what this is about. You, you fear the authoritarian, the dictator in waiting, whatever. Uh, if you worry about the state of democracy, you want this to be coming from the people through the elected representatives in Congress, and the executive branch just can't expand its power. Okay. So in this respect, Congress can do this tomorrow. It just has to get up and do it. Which should be quite a lift. Um, Zach, you're back. Good to see you. Uh oh. Very sorry about that. It's uh, a little okay. Harvard Wi Fi. A Wi Fi problem that does not require. Uh, well, that's, that, that's, that's, that's always a problem. I mean, um, I just had a wonderful friend who is a, uh, a podcast creator, does wonderful podcast music, and just moved to another European location. And the upload speed he <laughs> moved to was 0 0.02 <laughs> Mbps. Um, so, Zach, I'm, I'm wondering, do, do you have any thoughts about the uh, Biden decision about the uh, admissions that you'd like to add? I know you're focused more on the affirmative uh, action, but I'm curious. Or... Yeah, yeah, on student debt. Actually, to be honest, do not have thoughts. <laughs> um, it's, you know, uh, Mark just described one way in which this is fundamentally not a decision about education. There's another way in which this is fundamentally not a decision about education, which is that it's, it's, uh, it's retrospective. It only impacts, or almost only impacts students who were educated long ago. Uh, and so had very little, uh, in, in, in very few ways, changed the calculus for current students who are making choices about whether and where to go to college and, and what to study. Uh, and, and so for that reason, it, 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 as, a, as an economist, thinking through exactly those choices, either on behalf of institutions or students, this really wasn't a choice that sort of had very much for us to grab onto. Mm -hmm. And there's a follow-up note, too, and for the audience, this is important, again, to see, you know, you got to look and see who's writing the opinions, what else is going on. There was the companion case of this, and I forget the name of it, but it was two folks challenging the HEROES Act for not covering their loans. And 9-zip, led by Alito, the court said, no, you all don't have standing. No one has to write a loan forgiveness act that includes you to. This can be a specified loan forgiveness act. Oh, so it's interesting. Oh, oh. So it's very interesting in the sense that, and this is getting no play whatsoever, the court said the HEROES Act is fine. You don't have standing to sue because you don't like it. The only problem here was simply, and this is, constitutional democracy is all about this, abide by the rules and separation of powers. If you want to do this, do it right. Please do it right. Um, it's important to keep that in mind. The HEROES Act is fine. It just can't be interpreted beyond, according to the court, what seems to be its fair interpretation. Congress is free to fix that. So what what happens next? I mean, Zach, you, meant, you made the very, very good point that uh, this is not a case really about uh, current students, but about uh, older students, um, people who have already had some college experience, some have degrees, some don't. Um, what's, the, uh, what's the next step? I mean, that's a, that's a whole, you know, tens of millions of people who are going to have to start repaying loans. Some are going to default or try to default. Uh, the New York Times helpfully reminded us that death does clear the slate, which uh, I think cheered up absolutely nobody. Um, what uh, what happens next? Do we have to see if the Biden administration can try uh, their plan B to try and pull this down a little bit? Or otherwise, are we just in for a big slew of repayment? Yeah, I, I'm not sure I have so much to add to exactly what you just said. What happens next is a tens of millions of people start repaying their loans and those who don't have lower credit scores and uh, in some cases wage garnishment well uh, i'm sorry to be right um my, you know my my job here is to uh, is, is to help facilitate the questions uh doyle asks uh in in a, a good question any thoughts on what plan b will be uh doyle there's actually a page on the department of education site 
uh, someone perhaps in the chat could find it. Uh, the uh, Secretary of Education emailed a ton of people about this. Um, it has three prongs to it, as far as I recall. Um, but uh, please, uh, if if no one comes up with this in the chat in the next couple of minutes, um, email me and uh, I'll get you a copy of it. Um, let's let's circle back then um, a, a bit more to the uh, admissions question. Um, I think we, we may be seeing a major blow to a lot of ambitious uh, and talented Black and Latino students who really want to get a spot in the creme de la creme of American higher education as we rank that, who want to get that seat at UT Austin or at uh, Harvard. Um, and it sounds like we'll be, you know, that population is going to then shift to other schools, which may be, as Mark pointed out, to other schools that are equally excellent. Um, and it may be that they shift somewhere else or perhaps see their career stymied. Um, well, as we scramble to try to try to think about this, let's let's look out a, a few more years, say, you know, four years, you know, the course of a theoretical undergrad degree. Uh, what are some of the other impacts that we should be expecting? Uh, what's going to happen to these students? How are these, what are some ways the university are going to respond? Yeah, so actually, I'm going to look at a little further than that and Please. give you a sense of what happened over the 20 years after California banned affirmative action in 1998. And I think this is a sort of useful way of thinking about this. Take um, uh, people, Black and Hispanic workers in the state of California who are earning at least $100,000 a year and are in their early 30s. So like 15 years after the affirmative action ban is implemented. This yeah. is the, uh, you can imagine like the first group of 31 to 35 year olds, none of whom had access to affirmative action in the state of California when they yeah. went to college, say 15 years earlier. So this, this occurred in about 2014, 2015. Uh -huh. And so you can just count out, okay, how many high earning 35 black and Hispanic professionals were there in the state of, in uh, 2014, 2015? The answer is about 22,000 such individuals. This is a big state. There's a lot of high earning black and Hispanic young professionals. And then you can ask, okay, how many more would there have been if affirmative action had lasted another five or 10 years? Sure. And when these young professionals had applied to college, you know, had, they had had access to more selective universities because all of California's public universities still had active affirmative action oh. programs. Oh. And so that's estimable. You can see how many uh, successful young professionals there were who were coming out of universities a couple of years before affirmative action was banned. You can see how many there were after. And so it's a pretty straightforward number to estimate. And the answer is there would have been something like seven or 800 more Black and Hispanic successful young professionals uh, in 2014, 2015 than there were actually. So, so we're talking about like 3% uh, is the number of successful young Black and Hispanic professionals who disappeared, who ended up earning less than $100,000 a year or who left the state of California because they didn't have access to the UC Irvine or the UC San Diego or the Santa Barbara yeah. or whatever it may have been because those schools affirmative action policies ended. And that's a, I, I, at least, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's a relatively small number. What this suggests is that there are a lot of ways of succeeding in America that don't run through elective universities and that most of these kids were still going to college. Many of them mm -hmm. were going to the same school they would have otherwise gone to. As Mark said, only a, you know, some share of them uh, ended up going to a less selective school than they had previously enrolled at. And so you know, what you see is like there is this net effect, right? Like, the, the fact that university uh, preferences ended had long run implications for these young black and Hispanic workers. But it wasn't like a radical transformation of the California labor market. It just meant that there were fewer successful black and Hispanic workers by about 3% than there would have been us. So if we, if we just crudely multiply that number, say roughly we're talking about say 30,000 uh, black and uh, Latino, uh, you know, 18 year olds who, across the US, um, which, is, which is a blow um, and needs to be addressed. But, um, but, but I have to stop there because it is four o'clock on the East Coast um, and we have ran through our hour um, the two of you, uh, gentlemen, have given us a, a wonderful way of thinking about these really, really challenging rulings. Uh, you've, you've covered everything from practical politics to constitutional law uh, to how institutions uh, work at the academic scale. 
thank you both so much, especially for doing this at the drop of a hat. Sure, thank you. Uh, uh, Mark, what's what's the best way for people to keep up with you uh, and to you know follow you know what you're what you'll be doing? Email for now. I've got to get a website up and running, but um, you know uh, I'm available. Uh, I'd love to trade notes with anybody. Uh, I, don't know, I can put my email in the chat. Um, Please do. Please. Do. I don't. I don't. I need. I would love to be. You know, one one percent of the blogger that Brian is, <clears throat> and then I could actually <laughs> get uh, email I'd love to trade notes. And then and, uh, uh, JD, you had a, a great question up in the chat. You might want to email Mark and, and bounce an idea off of him. Zach, it's uh, it seems like keeping up with you is like tracking an electron as it whirls around a nucleus. <laughs> um, uh, what's what's the best way to keep up with you? Is it your website? Yeah, so I, I'm easy to find on Twitter. Uh, my website's available. You know, I, I right, I have this new book out, Metrics That Matter, that I think has a bunch of contact information in there as well. Okay. Um, but yeah, I, 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 you know, Google will lead you to be wherever I happen to be. Excellent, and we'll do that. We'll do that for much. And congratulations on, yeah, uh, on your on your new situation, and and thank you both very much. Um, but uh, uh, friends, um, don't leave yet because we have uh, um, we have to tell you about what's happening next uh, on the forum. Uh, but I do want to uh, also ask you all. Um, I hope that this emergency session um, was helpful for you. Um, please let me know uh, what you thought. Um, if you'd like us to do this for any similar situations uh, or for any similar problems, uh, please let me know. Um, this was an experiment and you all have participated and you're all very good. Now, if you'd like to keep talking about this experiment, but specifically about the Supreme Court decisions and their impact on higher education, um, please turn to social media as you can. Uh, just use the hashtag FTTE. You can find me on Twitter, as you can see here, and you can find me on Mastodon. And of course, you can find my blog right there. So please keep talking about this. Uh, if you'd like to look into our previous sessions, including ones where uh, Zach was a guest and Mark a participant, as well, we've talked about race and higher education, as well as finance and higher education, take a look at tidyurl.com slash FTF archive. You can find them all there. If you want to look ahead to our upcoming sessions on everything from AI and campus economics, just go to forum.futureofeducation.us and you can see it there. And of course, please subscribe to my Substack. I would love to hear your thoughts um, about uh, what I'm finding and forecasting about AI and education. Uh, and once again, thank you all for submitting a terrific range of questions. Uh, it's great to think together with all of you. Uh, I hope you're all well. I hope the summer, which is unbelievably hot this week, um, I hope it treats you safely. Take care, everyone, and we'll see you next time, including tomorrow, online. Bye-bye. <laughs>